as we keep, we never use. Now, we're also going to talk a lot about story today, and story is what is driving all of your disorganization. And the story might even be, oh, Andrew, you don't know me. I'm the exception to the rule. 80% of the stuff that I'm keeping actually is totally valuable, and it is important, and I will use it someday. I don't know when, but it, was, it took me a long time to gather this stuff. I'm going to hold on to it. So you don't really know me, and, and I am the exception. I'm going to tell you that you might be quite remarkable and exceptional in any number of ways in your personal and professional life. When it comes to stuff, I'm going to bet that you are, in fact, the rule. So who here is familiar with the Pareto Principle? Raise your hand. Great. Okay. So this is another iteration of the 80-20 rule of Pareto. Workers waste four to six weeks a year looking for misplaced documents. That might be more than your vacation is spent just looking for stuff. 3% of all documents are lost or misplaced forever. So that, again, is if you've got a server with a million documents on it, 3,000 of them you're never going to find again. They're going to be mislabeled. They're going to be misfiled. They're not going to be backed up. They're going to become corrupted. This is one of the few places where I believe in redundancy is in backing up. I don't believe in a lot of paper redundancy, but I do believe in digital backups because I back up to a cloud, I back up to a server, and I back up to an external hard drive in my office. So there's four copies of my files at any given time because I have received many phone calls at odd hours from clients who say, hey, my computer just died. What should I do? And the next thing that I say to them is, well, you've been backing up, haven't you? And they're like, that box that's sitting on my desk? I, I, the USB cable is not connected, should it be? <laughs> yes, it should have been, and now I don't know what to tell you. So this is one of the few places where redundancy is really important. Communication technology interrupts us every 10 minutes, and on average it takes 23 minutes to recover from one of those interruptions. So this is really simple math. Two interruptions, two recoveries, it's an hour gone. If you get to the end of your day and you think, good grief, I was crazy busy today and I got nothing done, it's very likely that you were constantly interrupted, did your best to recover, and you got to the end of the day and had nothing to show for it. So we want to be able to stop those interruptions, and that's one of the first things we're going to talk about. The average adult, this is my favorite statistic, the average adult will tell 200 lies a day. <laughs> Just let that sit in. Really, because it's early. What is it? It's like 9.35 in the morning. I, I don't know how many you've already told, but you're well on your way to your 200. What it's also useful to know, what it's also, also useful to know is that um, probably two-thirds of those are never leaving your head. Probably 120 of them you're saying to yourself. The other 80 you're actually saying out loud. And the average person will waste a year of their life looking for lost and misplaced items. Now, Nobody's going to spend a year of their life looking for their mobile phone or their keys or their wallet or their reading glasses, right? Um, uh, uh, where are you? Right, there you go. You're not going to spend a year of your life looking for your reading glasses. You're probably going to spend a day or two and then you're going to go get some more readers. I call this nickel and diming ourselves out of a year of our life because it's five minutes here, it's ten minutes there, and you're going to tell yourself, oh, I'm going to make up that lost time. I know a shortcut. For those of us who live in New York, you're going to say, oh, maybe when I get downstairs and hit the platform, the train's going to just be pulling into the station. Maybe I'm going to get super lucky and it's going to run express, and I can make up that lost time by sliding right past a few stops. But this is, again, your bookkeepers and accountants. You can't make up lost time. Once the five minutes have been spent, once the ten minutes have been spent, you can't get them back. That's crazy bad math that you're doing in your head, and that's one of your 200 lies that you're gonna make it up. If you say, I'm gonna get up extra early tomorrow morning, three o'clock in the morning, it's three o'clock for everybody in your time zone. It's not 2.30 for you and three o'clock for everybody else. You can't bank time. You can bank money, you cannot bank time. So we need to get in the math and live in the math is how we're gonna move forward. This is what you need to know about clutter. Clutter is nothing more than deferred decisions. Decisions you didn't make in real time. So the first thing that you set down was not necessarily clutter, it was a thing. It was the second thing that you set down on top of it and said, oh, I'm gonna put this away later. And in fact, I think this is good strategy because they both go the same place. So I'm gonna actually wait, I'm, I'm gonna defer this, but I'm gonna put them both away at the exact same time. And then the third thing that you set down until you got that little stack stacked up and you're thinking, well, over the weekend, I'm actually gonna set aside some 
dedicated time, and I'm going to put all this away, but then it's raining, and you think, I think I'd rather go to the movies, or it's sunny, and you think, maybe I'd rather go outside and play in the yard or go golfing. And you keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. So I want to do a little space-time continuum with you. I want you to think about everything that happened before you walked into this room. About that, That's the past. And we're going to put that over here. This is going to be that pile of clutter. It's going to be the stuff that's sitting on your countertops, it's on the floor, on your credenza, on your desktop, whatever it is. This is the past. This is the present, real time. It is right now. Who's got a watch? What time is it? 9.44 a.m. Eastern Time. The present, the past, the present. This is the future. This is where staying organized happens. That's where getting organized happens. We use the same muscles, but it isn't the same thing that happens. So you can go home. You can drill down through all of this stuff, which you can do. I've, I've been doing this work for 21 years. I've worked with over 100,000 people. As I said, you are lovely people and not exceptional. You can make this go away too. I don't care how much stuff you have, it'll go away. You can drill down into it. If you do not change your behavior, you're just gonna make more crap over here, right? It's gonna be new recipes that you're ripping out of Martha Stewart living. It's gonna be new maps that you print them off the internet. You have some of those. Yeah. It's gonna be new stuff that you're bringing in, but it's basically the old stuff just with a new face on it, right? Likewise, you could leave this room, totally drink the Kool-Aid, never make any more mess, which would be awesome, but if you don't allow enough time to drill down into this, this is just going to sit here and haunt you for the rest of your life. So we want to make sure that you get rid of this and you change your behavior so we're not making more of it. It's actually surprisingly simple. It isn't always easy, but it is definitely simple. So here's the story. When I talk about story, this is the story that's running in the back of your head, and this is sometimes what comes out of your mouth, some of your 200 lies. I'm busy. Anybody in this room ever say I'm busy when somebody asks you how you are? Yeah. Let's be clear, that's not a feeling. <laughs> so you can say I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm tired. I'm busy means nothing. Let's be clear, if you don't live at home and your mom isn't doing your laundry and making your meals for you, you're busy. And you're going to be busy until you're in a diaper and a rocking chair. I spoke at one of these conferences. I had a 94-year-old woman in the front room. She's been retired for 24 years. She's busy. There's never going to be a time when you're not going to have something to do. So this idea that when you get somewhere in your imaginary future place where there's going to be nothing to do and you're going to clean up this crap, if you didn't want to do it today, you're certainly not going to want to do it when you're retired. So we, again, we just have to poke a hole in that. There isn't enough time. There is enough time for what's important when you know what's important. If you don't know it's important, then you're just in, you're in your head, and of course there will not be enough time. I don't know where to start. People love to say this. They love to say that they're confused when they don't like their choices. This sucks, this sucks more. I don't wanna do either of them. The federal government loves this. They do a lot of teaching down in DC. They love when the administration changes because things that used to be priorities are no longer priorities. So if they can outweigh the administration, things that they want to procrastinate on just fall away. That's where your tax dollars are going. <laughs> so let's not, let's not mimic them. Let's be clear. Sometimes you really don't have enough information to move forward, but often it's a deferral from acting because you don't like what's in front of you. And you think, if I wait long enough, something will change. You will get older. Nothing can change. <laughs> There are people that are worse than I am. I love this, as if it's a race to the bottom. <laughs> I get mixed messages. You know what the cure to mixed messages is? Asking questions for clarity. It's very simple. You're giving, if you tell me to do this one day, you tell me to do this the next day, all I have to do is say to you, Maya, yesterday you asked me to do this, today you asked me to do that. I'll do either of them, I'll do both of them. Which, which, which is more important to you? Which would you like me to do first? It's very easy to get clarity around mixed messages. If you can speak, if you can communicate, it doesn't even have to be verbal. If you can communicate, you can get clarity. And the last one is for the nihilists in the group. Nothing works or lasts, so why bother? As if, first of all, let's be clear, if you're speaking in absolutes, if you're saying nothing, everything, always, never, you're in one of those 200 lies. Because few things are all or nothing. Anybody else in the role of remember Dragnet? Raise your hand. Excellent. For those of you who are not, perhaps you know Sherlock. <laughs> Pick up all the bases. Either way, what we want to do is be channeling our inner detective. We are looking for the facts, not the story. The story is not important. So Joe Friday used to show up on people's doorsteps and he would say, just the facts, man, just the facts. That's all he wanted. He didn't want the story. The story's not going to help him solve the crime. The facts are going to help him solve the crime. So that's, we want to be channeling our inner detective, looking for the facts, 
And when people start to tell you a story, it should tip you off. They are obviously trying to get around a piece of information. They don't want to give me a fact. They want to explain something to me, and they want to make it make sense to them, and then they want me to buy into their story. So you can also recognize if somebody says to you, oh, I don't want to pick on you again, you are Virginia. If I say to you, Virginia, are you free for lunch tomorrow at 4 o'clock? It's a yes or no question. It's not... I don't know. Well, let me check my calendar. Maybe I have, to pick, I have to see about whether the dog sitter can show up. And I got the kids have soccer, so I am not sure. That's not an answer. It's a, it was a yes or no question. So be mindful if people are starting to spin a story to you and start to recognize for yourself when you are spinning a story to a yes or no question. Because you're in one of your 200 lives. These are our problems. We base our choices on comfort rather than our values. Our values are lasting, our comfort is temporary. And let's be clear, everybody in this room is comfortable. Anybody in Western America, at Western culture and in America specifically, is plenty comfortable. Your comfort is already taken care of. Food, clothing, and shelter is covered. Now you might be momentarily in positions or discom uh, uncomfortable, but relatively speaking to the world's population, you are more comfortable than 80% of the people alive right now. So, Worrying about your comfort rather than living your values is one of the first things that you have to let go of because you are already comfortable. We say yes to unsuitable requests. Anybody in here a people pleaser? Raise your hand. Yeah, you guys need to go on visits if you're people pleasers. <laughs> we accept unimportant interruptions. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We procrastinate. We defer our decisions. And we don't know our concentrated limits. If you have ADHD, if you have a difficult time holding your concentration, if you can only stay focused for seven minutes at a time, you need to leverage that and make that an asset in your arsenal. You need to work in seven minute increments, set a timer for seven minutes. It doesn't serve you to look at your neighbor and say, well, why can they stay focused for 45 minutes? I want to stay focused for 45 minutes. Because you might as well ask, why are they blonde and I'm brunette? Why are they six feet tall and I'm 5'2"? Why do they have blue eyes and I have brown eyes? I don't know. What difference does it make? You're not going to change it. What you want to do is leverage something that used to hobble you into something that you can actually work with so that you can make it work for you instead of against you. These are your solutions. Your calendar is to time what your budget is to money. Now, if you don't keep a budget, this might sound like gibberish to you. <laughs> But if you do keep a budget, you understand that every decision you make about how you're going to spend your time on the day is based on your calendar. You schedule discrete appointments with yourself, and that's how you use your time and space. We need to exchange excellence for perfection. Anybody in here a perfectionist? Raise your hand. I wonder if any of those people pleasers are raising their hand now. That would be trouble. Because you will never get to perfection if you are also a people pleaser. Let's be clear that we can all get to excellence. Nobody's going to get to perfect. We need to focus on important rather than urgent. We'll talk about that in just a minute. We need to eat the frog. Who in here has heard the expression eat the frog? Awesome. Awesome. For those of you who haven't, this was coined by Mark Twain and then made popular by Brian Tracy, who's a productivity expert. The idea is if you eat a live frog first thing in the morning, the rest of the day gets better. <laughs> it's a metaphor. You don't actually have to eat the frog. But you do, have to, you do have to take on that thing that you've been putting off. And then the last thing to do is to delegate. And everybody in here has someone you can delegate to, even if you live alone with three cats. There's TaskRabbit, there's Craigslist, there's the boy or girl down the block who can mow your lawn. Anybody could help you if you're willing to let go of your perfectionism, right? Anybody can drop off your dry cleaning. It doesn't have to be you. Anybody can communicate to the dry cleaner, hey, pay extra attention to the collar and there's a stain on the sleeve. That doesn't need to be you. You can let go of that. So, urgent versus important. When the house is literally on fire, urgent and important are completely in sync. If the house is not literally on fire, urgent will always trump important if you don't know what is important. Urgent is loud, shiny, busy, flashy. It's always going to steal focus. Important is quiet and steady. And it's not, going to, it's not going to demand attention. It just lives there. So it is essential to know what your core values are. Now, at my website, www.andrewmellon.com, M-E-L-L-E-N, you can download a free set of core value exercises. They're available in my book. 
You can also Google core value exercises and you'll probably get three million hits in 30 seconds. You don't have to do mine, but I encourage you to do a set of core value exercises. If you live with other people, the family should do them together. If you work with a team, do them as a team. If you've ever had the experience where somebody says, I think the first thing we should do is this, and you think, God, if that was the last thing we did, it would not negatively impact our process. That's probably because they are in alignment with their values, you are in alignment with your values, but you do not know what the company's or the team's values are. So these are tremendously powerful exercises. This is not busy work. Because I promise you, at some point, if it hasn't already happened, urgent and important are going to collide. And if you do not know what is important, you're gonna get swept up into the volunteer fire department. You're gonna be running around putting out fires, other people's fires. You're gonna to get to the end of the day and think, Jesus, I was crazy busy today. What happened? Everybody else got their work done because you were helpful, particularly if you're a people pleaser and a perfectionist. And now, now you have to do your work. It's six o'clock at night and your work hasn't even been addressed. So. 168 hours in a week, everybody gets the same amount of time. 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour. This is simple math, this is bodega math. If you can go to CVS and buy a pack of gum, you can do this math. So if you've got a story that says, you know, math is not my strong suit. I'm gonna tell you that first of all, it's one of your 200 lies. And second of all, this is the math that you can manage. So everybody can do 168 hours. When it comes to getting and staying organized, these are your two best friends, timer and a stopwatch. Timers to quantify everything that can't easily be quantified. So you're no longer allowed to say, I'm gonna work in the garage until I'm finished. Because that's arbitrary narrative. I don't know what finished means. But if you say to me, I'm gonna work in the garage for three hours, when that timer goes off, you won. Failure breeds failure, success breeds success. The last time you tried to clean the garage, you came out filthy after nine hours, everything wasn't done, yet stuff in your driveway was a mess. The next time you go to clean the garage, you're already feeling beat up. Whereas if you set the timer for three hours, you go out to the garage, you kick ass, timer goes off, ding, 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 you feel like a rock star. You are like, I'm gonna go inside, I'm gonna get a snack, I'm going back into the garage for three more hours. I didn't think I was gonna make 15 minutes, look at me. Three hours in the garage, set the timer and you're back in the garage. Failure breeds failure, success breeds success. The stopwatch is to time everything that you've got a story about that says, oh, it takes me 15 minutes to do the laundry takes me 20 minutes to get to work. Maybe, and maybe that's a story. If you time yourself, you'll actually have some empirical fact. I want it to take me 20 minutes to get from my apartment in Hell's Kitchen to the Upper East Side to a client, because I don't bill for travel time in Manhattan. It takes me 47 minutes door to door. If I only allow 20 minutes, I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna tell one of my 200 lies and say, that damn train, I was on the platform, I've been waiting forever for that train, I'm so sorry I'm late. I'm the most organized man in America, but I can't help the train. It's all just bull crap. I, I've timed it, I know it's 47 minutes, but I resent having to give her those 27 minutes that I can't bill her for. I only want my commute to be 20 minutes, so I just need to get into, I need to get into alignment with my values and with the truth and understand 47 minutes is what it takes. So, there's a free time tracking app called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L. There is no E in Toggle. I encourage, I don't get any remuneration from sharing this with you, but I encourage you to download this app, track your time for a week, seven days, everything that you do, everything, bio breaks, sex, napping, doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to time yourself while you're having the sex, but start the app and then start making out and then you can, you know, when you finish, you can turn the app on. But the idea is I want, I want you to know how long it takes you to do everything. <laughs> and then you will use that information to build your day based on fact, not on fiction. So now if everybody would please do this for me. It's my favorite part of the morning. Raise your hands up big. This is trademark technology I'm sharing with you, so I want some deep enthusiasm. And now repeat after me. One home for everything. One home for everything. Light with light. Life with life. Something in. Something, something in. in. Something out. Something out. All right, we're going to do it one more time. Really, muster up your best Friday morning enthusiasm. Actually, stand up. <laughs> now, one home for everything. One home for everything. Life with life. Life, life with life. life. Something in. Something, something in. Something out. Something out. All right, give me something in. 
That is the organizational triangle. And that's all you need to know to get to stay organized. One home for everything means everything has one home and only one home. Not open to debate. I don't care where you keep your keys, but your keys have a home, your keys have a home, your keys have a home. They're either in their home or they're unlocking something. They can only ever be one of two places. You use this rule, you'll find anything in 30 seconds or less, guaranteed. Like with like means all like objects are together, not most of them. <laughs> so all of the office supplies live together, not most of them. All of your cooking utensils live together, not most of them. All of your tools live together, not most of them. You don't keep most of the tools in the toolbox, but the screwdriver and the hammer in the junk drawer in the kitchen. Because you've got a story that says, oh, you know, I don't want to go all the way into the garage to find the hammer and the screwdriver. I just want those handy. But then everybody else who's looking for the hammer and the screwdriver is in the garage in the toolbox thinking, I have a pipe cutter. Boy, don't we have a hammer? Where's the hammer? So these two rules, one home for everything and like with like, will cure 85% of your disorganization. The last rule, something in, something out, is all about achieving stuff equilibrium. It's about having enough of everything that serves you and nothing that doesn't. It's very simple. And I don't care what it is. If any professional organizer that would say, oh, you're only allowed to have 17 sweaters or 14 pairs of shoes or three hats is lying to you. That's one of their 200 lies. You can have as much that will fit into your space. But if your space can't contain everything, you either need bigger space or less stuff. It's pretty simple. Again, it's very simple math. If you can't fit 150 pairs of shoes into your closet, you either need to remove some other garments, you need to get a bigger closet, or you need to have fewer shoes. But if 150 pairs of shoes will fit in your closet, you are welcome to have them. I will not take them away from you. What I will say to you, yes, yes, give yourselves a hand for that. You can have 150 pairs of shoes. A professional organizer said the most organized man in America told you you could have that many shoes. What I will tell you is that when you buy the 151st pair, it's because you're ready to retire one. We don't accumulate. All of those stories that you're telling yourselves about, oh, I've got 15 minutes, I'm just going to kill some time at the mall. If you don't have enough time already, you certainly don't have enough time to murder it. <laughs> so let's be really clear about what we're saying and use those 15 minutes for something else. All right, we're going to talk about emails, papers, and filing for a bit. These are my top five tips for email. The number one rule is check email only when you have the time to read it and answer it. And you know what, you can write this stuff down, but I'll also get you the slide deck afterwards. If you, give, if you stop by the booth and give us your email address, we'll send you the deck, so that's fine. You don't have to, you don't have to scribble. Thanks, you're, you're welcome. Um, so check it only when you have the time to read it and reply to it. I'm going to break this down for you, right? You read it, you don't answer it, that's just wasted time. You read it, you don't answer it, and it upsets you. Now you can't focus on what you need to be doing because you're composing the snarky response in your head. <laughs> so you're completely distracted. It's much better to stay focused and do what you're doing. Don't read and answer it constantly throughout the day. I answer email twice a day. I'm not a brain surgeon. Nobody is trying to reach me because they're bleeding out in an operating room. I'm a professional organizer. <laughs> Likewise, unless it's critical, and if it's critical, they'll call me, they'll find me some other way. Email is not the means to reach me for something important. Don't keep hammering, you know, urgent, urgent, urgent. It's not gonna, it's not gonna land, I'm not gonna see it. Don't answer at your most productive time of the day. I'm a writer and I get up early in the morning and that's the best time for me to write. It's not the time for me to be checking my email. Automate filing you using rules or filters. Who here uses rules or filters to pre-sort their emails? Excellent. For those of you who don't, you can Google using rules or filters with Gmail, Hotmail. It doesn't matter what your email client is, whether it's web-based or desktop-based. doesn't matter, but you can configure rules and filters to sort by sender, by domain, by subject, by keywords. Tremendous time saver. Unclutters your inbox. And the last thing is that if the message is less than 15 words, you can make the subject line the message and terminate it with an EOM for end of message. We love this. My assistant, Maya, in the back will attest to it. We use this all the time. So it's almost like chat because there's nothing to open up. The, mess the subject is the message. It's a tremendous time saver. You can also terminate with an NRN, no reply needed. So we can break apart that habit of great thank you, no thank you, you bet, can't wait, you too, see you soon. Nobody wants to be the first person to stop because you don't want to be called rude. Before filing, these are the questions you need to ask yourself. Why do I want it? Why do I need it? They're not the same thing. Why is it important? 
Can I get it elsewhere? When and how will I use it? Is it timely, accurate, and reliable? Is it a Yelp review that you printed up from some angry person who didn't like the service at the restaurant? And then do you need it for more than a few days? If the answer is no, you don't need to file this. Understand filing cabinets are where documents go to die. It's the graveyard of documents. If you are, if you are stacking up papers meaning to file them, but they're things that you don't actually need, you don't actually need them. So I also have on my website, you can go and download some file naming conventions. If you don't have a, a guide to how your files are named so that anybody can find something, God forbid something happens to you and somebody needs to get into your file cabinet to find it, they don't know, is it under A for auto, is it under C for car, is it under A and C? Did you, you know, did you forget that you started it as auto and then you created another folder? Like you couldn't find it under C because you forgot that you called it auto. So you're looking under C for car. Where is it? I don't have it. I'll start a new folder. Now you've got two folders. Half the information is in each place. So it's much better to have a uniform way of naming things and that way everybody can find everything and it's, it's universal and it's consistent. Let's talk about time for a second. This is the big secret, folks. You cannot manage time. You can only manage yourself in relationship to time. As Steve Miller says, time keeps ticking, ticking, ticking into the future. There's nothing you can do about it. So you have control of yourself. You cannot stop the clock. I didn't make up time. I, I wish I could help you to break apart time and change your relationship to it, but all we can do is actually manage ourselves in relationship to the clock. These are the top big time thieves, the top five. Interruptions, multitasking, overcommitting. That's not saying no. Procrastination and meetings. Interruptions. Who can tell me the difference between an interruption and a distraction? Raise your hand. Please. Yes! <laughs> Give her a hand! <laughs> yes. Interruptions happen to you, distractions are self generated. So, what kinds of interruptions and distractions happen at work? These are some of the kinds of interruptions and distractions at work and happen at work. So I'm gonna give you now one minute, turn to the person next to you, and the first person is going, to, is going to talk, the person with the shorter hair is going to talk, and you are going to share the kinds of interruptions that happen to you, and then the other person's gonna share distractions. So you've got one minute, we're, we're starting right now, and go. So that's the only way to actually stop interruptions. Short of that, these are some ways that you can minimize the impact. You can make time constraints known at the beginning. I've got 15 minutes. Then set a timer. It actually has to be 15 minutes, because if you let it run over, then they're going to know that your word doesn't mean anything. 
run an errand. Great thing to do is stand up and say, come with me to the kitchen. I'm going to go get a snack and we can talk about your issues as we're walking. Use voicemail and email strategically, so let things roll to voicemail. If you don't need to pick up the phone, you don't need to pick up the phone. You're not an operator. You're running a business. You can disable automatic email checking so things aren't constantly beeping and chirping at your face. You can, don't, you, you can avoid going online except when it's absolutely necessary and then batch all of your online activities regardless of the ninja that you think you are, that you're just on and off the internet. You're probably not. You can isolate yourself for concentrated effort. You can schedule meetings outside your office. Great to meet people at a Starbucks or another at a coffee shop, and that way, in an hour, you get up to leave. The meeting's over. And the last thing you can do is keep a bag or a, pack of, a stack of papers on a chair so that people can't sit down. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Multitasking. He can't do it, she can't do it. Multitasking doesn't exist. If it's on your resume, you can take it off as one of your 200 lies. You cannot bake a cake and do open heart surgery at the exact same time. You can do it sequentially, but you cannot do them simultaneously. Multitasking doesn't exist. They did a study at the University of London, 1,100 workers. Multitasking, specifically with electronic media, created a greater decrease in IQ than smoking pot or pulling an all-nighter. Yes. Exactly. So you think like, oh, I've got my tablet and I've got my smartphone, I'm firing on all 12 cylinders, I'm amazing. No, you're actually worse than somebody who's high or hasn't slept in 24 hours. That's the truth. Another one you're doing a lot. For the people pleasers, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> not an excuse. You can suggest a trade-off, Tuesday, not today. And the best thing to do is don't procrastinate. The only thing better than good news is bad news fast. You're not doing anybody a favor by saying, maybe I'll get back to you in 48 hours if in those 48 hours you're thinking, how do I get out of this without upsetting them? Because what I'm thinking is, she's trying to rearrange her schedule to accommodate me. Isn't that awesome? It's only going to be that much more disappointing when you come back in 48 hours and say, yeah, I just couldn't make it work. I'm so sorry. I could have gone, and that no would have released me to go find a yes 48 hours sooner. So you're not helping anybody. It's one of your 200 lies. Oh, the last thing is to remember that saying no to something is actually saying yes to something you value more. We tend to be so glass half empty in our focus, like, oh, I'm going to miss an opportunity. What, were the, what about all the things you already committed to doing? Why did those suddenly become second nature, you know, uh, second tier goals or objectives? They were things that you were very fired up about last week. Why now are they chopped liver? Procrastination. Can we talk about that now or later? <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't have a calendar with a Sunday on it, neither do you. If you're booking things for Sunday, you might as well just say never. You might as well say I have no intention of ever doing it. Because that's really what you're saying. It doesn't exist. Why do you procrastinate? Here, it's a menu. Select. It's all about it. You can help yourself. These are all of the reasons people procrastinate. It doesn't matter. People procrastinate for different reasons for different things. What can you do to stop procrastinating? You can eat the frog. That's it. I, you know, you can batter fry it. You can slap some tartar sauce on it. You can do whatever you want to it. The, the number one way to get through procrastination is just to belly up and eat the frog. That's it. I, there is no magic secret formula. It's very simple. Every task has a beginning and an end. That's what makes it a task. The end of doing the laundry is not a basket of clean clothes on your bedroom floor. <laughs> It's when the clothes have been put away, the basket's empty, it's back on top of the dryer. That's the full arc of the task. So again, if you get to the end of the day and you think, gosh, I was crazy busy today. I started a million things, didn't finish a single one. It's very possible that you metaphorically left the laundry sitting on your bedroom floor. Finish the task and then move on. The last thing I'm going to share with you before I take a few questions is when everything is precious, nothing is precious. You have... You have to be able to tell the difference between trash and treasure, and everybody can. If you're holding on to everything and you're in that vague, soupy, story place, it's like, well, it's all beautiful. It's all stuff. I mean, I, I curated a lovely collection of things. I love them all. They're all my babies. I could never let go of any of them. Understand that if everything is precious, you're living in a museum, and that's probably not true. If nothing is precious, you're living in a dump, and that's probably not true either. You're probably somewhere in between. 
I'm gonna leave you with an anecdote about this that perfectly illustrates it. I was helping a client on Staten Island clean out her grandmother's house. We found two silver objects from grandma in the house. One was a ball of aluminum foil under the kitchen sink, because grandma had survived the, the Great Depression and kept aluminum foil. I'd like to never used it, but my grandmother did the same thing. So a ball of aluminum foil. We also found a sterling silver tea set. If we had stopped and just said, oh, two silver objects, both from grandma, keep them both, right? I mean, it's the last ball of aluminum foil grandma's ever going to assemble. We can't just let it go. <laughs> we recycled the ball of aluminum foil. We sold the sterling silver tea set for $22,000 at auction. Oh yes. So clearly, we can tell the difference between trash and treasure. All right? And with that, I'm going to open up the floor to some questions. Please. So see that you uh, have issues with some of this, people are going to say, what's the first thing to do to start? Well, tell me about your issues. <laughs> <laughs> no story, just the fact about the issue. Yeah, so, so I, I have two. The first is um, I have about 7,000 emails. They're kind of, some are categorized. Story, 7,000 was the fact. Right. Okay. My second issue is that I value a quick response, so I have created a business with a very quick response that keeps me tied to email and phone, and I know I need to stop it, but it goes against values. So how do you do that? Well, so did everybody hear the question? 7,000 emails, and her, one of her values is quick response. What I would say to you is, I would look at all of your values and see how quick response is competing with the rest of them, because one of them might be less stress, more time available for the things that matter. So I would want you to be able to, to look at both of them. But like, I don't want to just spitball an answer that, sure. that short changes the, the, ultimate, the ultimate answer. I'm going to ask you to look at how all of the values line up there and how you can, because there's multiple answers to how you can still respond quickly without you having to necessarily respond quickly. Perhaps you can hire somebody who builds at a lower rate than you to answer. Perhaps you can have an FAQ page where all of the commonly asked questions can be listed. So we can tease that out and figure out ways to get you out of the equation so you're not the person who has to rapidly respond, but the business can still rapidly respond. The other thing. Oh, you know? We'll just go. We'll the other thing There you go. So, so, so maybe some of your perfectionism and your people pleasing is pushing oh, you I'm into. Not a people pleaser. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is totally all for me. I am not a people pleaser. Okay. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that at face value. Cool. Does that help? Yeah. Great. Do you have a question? Uh, I've got a question. Was... Yep, go. My question is about email and files. Where to start? I have a lot of emails and I have a lot of files and I've started a calibration system but I'm not happy with it. Okay, so, uh, and everybody can hear that. So we've got email and we've got filing. And I'm going to say that uh, I would create, do you have rules or filters running on your inbox? And it's still not helping? It's helping. It's helping. I just have the legacy emails that even though they're all in, I have legacy emails that are cluttering my mental space because I know they're not categorized. How, when, when you say legacy, what's the legacy? Are we talking about three months? Are we talking about three years? How old are they? I would say three months. I instilled a new process where my assistant will go through and categorize uh, actual personal emails so that I'm only responding to real emails that I need to respond to in one folder, and I dedicate a half hour to do that each day. Right. And so are you unhappy with how quickly it's going? I'm quite happy with it. I'm more concerned about, I don't know, maybe I should just not care about the other emails. Well, I'm going to say that if you haven't an answered an email in more than three months, you could probably acknowledge that you're not going to. That, I mean, if so, it's three months old. Whatever they asked you, they've answered or they've moved on. They're not waiting. 
So I think that three months is a fine line to draw in the sand and to say, I'm not going to get to these. Because be mindful, because for those of us who build, you know, dollars for hours, what is your time worth? What is your assistance time worth to be drilling down and trying to answer? There's, new, there's always new stuff coming in. If you're trying to clean up the old mess, I mean, you just have to at some point say, you could even send out a blanket email to your list and say, if I didn't respond, I'm sorry, I'm trying a new behavior. So as of this point, I'm gonna do something else. But if, I, if you wrote to me and I didn't respond, don't hate me, try again. Thank you so much. You're welcome. What else we got? How do you, um, within your own home, yes. and you find other people that don't embrace the same systems that you embrace, um, <laughs> so you want to, we talked about this a little bit, we yep. would be um, more minimalist yep. when you live with somebody who loves to collect clutter. Right. So, excellent question, thank you. So, uh, stuff discordance, where people are not evenly matched. How long have you been married? Have you changed in 33 years? <laughs> yeah. So, right. So the first thing I'm going to say is you know who you married, right? I mean, this should not be a surprise. You know, you, he, this is who he is. And if you want to be happily married more than you want to live in a minimalist house, you're both going to have to compromise, right? I mean, the, the first step is identifying. If everybody can identify that there's a common problem, then you can find a common solution. But if he doesn't agree with you that there is a problem, then the compromise is all on you. And you can have a room, you can have your office be exactly as you want it to be. You can even say, hey, sweetie, let's, defi let's define the house by zones, and these will be more clutter-free, and this is where you can keep your collections and things. But the first thing is really having the conversation and say, we both don't function the same way in the space, and I'd like us to. Do you agree? that we both don't function in the space the same way. And you have to build some consensus there, or you're just gonna be trying to get him to change his behavior, which is never gonna go well. I mean, and if you're the other, if you're the person who likes stuff and the other person keeps hammering on you, like, why do you keep leaving your crap laying around here? Why don't you just put your stuff away? It's the same conversation. We, we have a different way of approaching stuff. Do we agree about that? Excellent. So we're in agreement. Do we agree that we both want to be happy in the space? Great. Okay, a second agreement. Do we agree that we're willing to work on how we can get there? Yes or no? Because if they say no, then again, it's for you to get right with the fact that this is who you're living with. Now, I will tell you in extreme cases, I have, uh, I have friends in Northern Virginia, they actually built a house in the backyard for him because he didn't want to live with her up front. They, they sleep over in each other's homes. She, she was an architect, so she could do it. But they sleep over. But he keeps his space clean. She has all of her stuff in her space. And they, that's, you know, they have date night every night. <laughs> and we're at time. Thank you all very much.
you can uh, take it home with you. And with that, we are on break. We're going to be